All right. So by the way, there's a tech talk tomorrow night. We're extra credit if you want to go to that. And there won't be any lecture in 160, although I will be around after this to answer any questions from any class. And there's a uh, Pacific Hackers event this Saturday in Sunnyvale, although it will also be available online. The link is not here yet, but I'll put the link here as soon as it becomes available. So if you go to that, that's also worth extra credit. This is a good workshop in Wireshark. I know um, Irvin did it at DEF CON, and it was, um, it's a hit. People like it. I've seen it before. All right, so here we are at 129S. And, yes, there we go. All right, so I want to talk about the backend components, Chapter 10, and then I'll have a demo, which I'm very pleased. It took me a long while to figure this out. How to exploit cross-site scripting to steal cookies. is It's one of their more advanced cross-site scriptings, and it's worth talking about. So let's start with the slides, which are not up. All right, here it comes. Okay. All right. So, uh, there's backend components. Now, here's something you've done in earlier projects where you um, find a place where you are able to inject command lines into the operating system or access the file system and so on. So, if you do have commands in the API, which refer to the file system, like doing directory of an inter of a like a list of files in a directory or something like that. It often gives a command injection vulnerability. And here's an example in Perl. This is going to do a du command, which shows the amount of disk usage, and it's going to um, take this command and then it's going to add a parameter directory, which I think came from the user. That's what's going on here. Um, so anyway, I don't quite understand where the user data goes in here, but anyway, somehow it's a command line command, and some part of this is the user data, and so you've got um, command line injection. And so you see here, you can fill in that thing called directory, and if you make it slash public, then you see everything in the var www.html slash public. So that's using it as intended. You can see subdirectories of the HTML directory, but you can also make it slash public and then a pipe and then a space and cat space ets password, just like you did with the ping form in the first project in this class. You can take what's supposed to be a directory and you can add command line commands to it and then it executes those commands and prints out this publicly visible file ets password. So that shows uh, that you have command ejection. All right. Here's another example. HP OpenView was subject to the same thing. Again, you could there's a parameter called node, and you could put a pipe, and then your command at another pipe, and it would execute a command. Um, here's ASP, Microsoft Scripting Language. Uh, this is going to do a directory of that directory name, but again, the directory name here came from the user. C file store plus directory text. So once again you can add extra commands to go on that line. And here's um, a function that would let you feed in the name of a directory and print out the contents here. And if you put in ampersand ampersand IP config, it runs IP config down here and shows you your IP address. So that's another one. You did that also in the projects. All right. Uh, and PHP is the language I use to write those things. Once again, um, You've got a storage search parameter, and then you use the eval function to execute this, and eval executes commands on the command line again, and again, this is a parameter under the user's control, so once again, you can inject commands. So to find these things, um, any part of user data might be used to construct commands, and you often use special characters like semicolon, pipe, or ampersand. You can also use the backtick in a Linux environment. A backtick around something will cause it to execute immediately. And so um, you may not be able to see the results of the command, 
the simple cases you can see the results in other cases it might run the command but the output doesn't come to you so you might have to use a time delay or use a command that creates a network connection to something under your control so for example here's one where an app passed user input to NS lookup and some of these characters are blocked but not that and an invalid domain name causes an error message that includes the domain name so what you can do is you can put your script code in here and redirect it to an executable file it'll put this error message in the file server can't find and this will be the um, script code and then you browse to the file to execute it this is one of the many ways to do it um, so to prevent these things you shouldn't really write code in one language that creates a line of command line and executes it in another language anytime you write a command line that is simulating what a human would type it it's risky if you have to do this don't allow any input under to control to be put literally in the line just force the input to choose from a list of known good values and only let those good values in um, you could also use apis uh, command or in the operating system instead of building uh, command line commands all right so don't put user input into dynamic execution. If you think you have to filter it again with allow listing where you only let it take on known good values, you don't let people put in arbitrary values. A much weaker defense is deny listing where you try to deny all those special characters like pipe and ampersand, and that's very weak because there are often ways to sneak that character through. So then there's path traversal, a really old vulnerability. This used to be true when I saw Windows servers back in the days of Windows NT it was ridiculous this was part of the many reasons why back in like 90s and the early 2000s people said Linux was secure and Microsoft was ridiculously insecure because it had simple um, path traversal vulnerabilities so if you go here here's a common one where you have a, a script and it takes a file name as a parameter and you can add dot dot backslash to that file name to traverse out of the expected directory into other directories and point to other files. So this is local file inclusion. And you may be able to read or even write to files, find secret things in files, um, or overwrite critical files. And so you can prevent this by, or at least you can detect this by running file system monitoring tools. Um, Procmon is the modern tool on Windows that can be used for this. Tripwire is a Linux tool, and there are others. You can configure them to watch to see if important files have been changed and be aware if some unauthorized changes are happening. Uh, to detect path traversal as a pen tester, inject a unique string in each per submitted parameter, and then look at the file system monitoring tool to see if that string has appeared anywhere. That's one sort of programmable way to do it. And so here's a path traversal attack. See up here, file name equals dot dot backslash dot dot backslash. There are many dot dot backslashes. And then Windows win.ini. And win.ini is a file that was around on MS DOS machines and still on Windows XP. I don't know if it's still on Windows 10. But anyway, you see this file, which shows that you're able to read a file which is not uh, in the expected directory. So if you want to. Uh, exploit this and the server does some attempt to filter it then try both a normal slash and a backslash you can url encode these characters dot forward slash and backslash which is why i was saying trying to filter out these characters may be ineffective because you can encode them in various ways and your filtering may not account for all the encoding and so you can try using 16-bit coding with percent u you can do double url encoding um, where it has to be decoded twice, but there are um, web servers that do decode things twice. You can try overly long UTF-8 encoding, where it gets um, longer. And those last ones, by the way, are technically illegal, but they're often accepted. If you have filtering, you can try making a string which is intended to be, after filtering, if it strips out this dot dot slash, there'll be a dot dot slash left that sort of thing. Uh, how does making it longer help? Making it longer just might pass their, uh, just might bypass their filters. If they had explicitly filtered things like this, or more likely, if they just filtered this, then um, 
making it longer might fool it. That's the idea. Um, I see what you mean, though. If they're filtering those individual, simple filtering, this wouldn't stop. You know, there's just various ways to scramble it. Um, I agree with you. The simplest kind of filter, this would not get past. But other filters, it might. All right. So you can use null characters also, like here's something where it requires that your file name ends in JPEG. So you put a null byte before the JPEG, and now um, C-based engines will end the string here, but other engines might go past it. So this will pass the test saying it ends in .jpg, but when it's actually interpreted, it'll be interpreted to end here. Now that's quite a powerful trick. Uh, Dan Kaminsky used that to find a serious vulnerability in certificate sales, where he could buy a certificate that um, had a null byte in it, and therefore it was star null byte dot evil dot com, and that would match any domain. You have a broad card certificate that you could use to forge an HTTPS request on any domain. Um, all right. So if you can read files, you can look for files that contain passwords or configuration files or perhaps database credentials, or so on. Source code for things, log files, these are all targets that might have good stuff in them. And if you have write access, you might be able to create scripts in startup folders that will automatically run when people log in, or other automatically executing files, or just write to a web directory and then browse to that page, and that will execute the file. And if you want to prevent these, of course, as always, don't put user-controlled data into a file system API. Instead, make them choose only from a list of known good inputs. And if you're going to let them put in file names, then there are some recommended defenses. Um, after you do all decoding and decanonicalization, which means turning things like percent %20 into space and so on, then check for these special characters. If you find anything like this, reject the input. Don't try to clean it and use it. Just reject it. If it has anything suspicious, use a hard-coded list of permissible file types and so on. Uh, make sure that the file name is okay. Check to make sure it is in the expected directory. Use a, a function like get canonical path to make sure that the directory that you're actually planning to go to is in fact the directory you expected. So even if the hacker found some way to sneak in special characters, you will detect that. Another thing you can do is run your app in a root jail. This is an old, old Linux trick. You can run your app in a limited environment, which was a sort of thing like a virtual machine before there were virtual machines. It can only access files in this folder and subfolders, and you copy all the system files you need, copies of them into there, and now it can only reach things in that little region. It cannot possibly traverse out of there. In Windows, you can do the same thing by mapping a drive letter to this folder and using that drive letter to access the contents. And your defenses should log an alert on uh, violations. And so file inclusion vulnerabilities, if you include files all the time in JavaScript and other things to easily reuse code. Every language allows this. So you can, here you could specify a country and the country would be used to include country.php. But the problem is, um, the user can now inject evil code here, like go on to a different domain and load something.php from there. So that's a vulnerability you'd get from letting a file name be controlled by the user. Uh, that's remote file inclusion, where you actually go to a different server. Um, even if you have only local file inclusion, you might be able to find resources on the server you can execute. One common target is demonstration scripts that are included in things like IIS by default. So if you want to find these things, try inserting things in each parameter, a URL that goes to a web server, or a non-existent IP address to see a time delay, or a malicious script on the server, see if it will load and run that malicious script. If, it's, if it does send a request to your server, and, you know, try putting in executable static resources, traversal to another folder. These are ways to test for local file inclusion. All right. Let's take a look at a Kahoot. 10A. Sure. 
Cheroot and container cannot prevent things like the recent dirty pipe. Well, I, um, I don't know. It's a good question, but I don't know exactly what your requirements are for dirty pipe. You might be right, but I'm not sure. Uh, 129S10A. And the try hack me. Yeah, I did the try hack me. I did about the first half of it. I don't remember LFI. The one I oh try hack me Advent of Christmas. Okay, there wasn't. There was one called Advent of Christmas that was all just coding, not LFI. But there was a try hack me thing too. Yeah, that must be a different one. I didn't do that one. But yeah, they had a bunch of Christmas oriented uh, hacking games. Which are great, of course. Seen at 127 does have cahoots. A simple answer. It's just not, there aren't any of my current list of favorites because we just had that class yesterday and I used them up. There are more coming up. That's not the complete list of cahoots. I have hundreds. I just favorite the ones for like the one week ahead to make it easier to hunt through them. All right. And uh, give it a few more seconds. All right. Maybe we got everybody that's coming. All right, so what vulnerability lets you add malware from a different server? That's file inclusion. Good. All right. What defense puts the web server in a restricted file system? Yep, that's Cheroot. They call it a Cheroot Jail. And how do you detect file system modifications? Oh, that's good. Try Hack Me has a room about dirty pipe. Good. That's why I like those online CTFs. People keep them up to date and keep adding new challenges. It's great like the Web Security Academy, for that matter. All right. Uh, Procmon is the Windows tool to see file system modifications and other events. And what vulnerability do you get by using eval? Command injection, commonly the consequence of eval. All right, I think I know who that is. I know who that is. And I think I know who that is. All right, good. All right. 
So, the next one is XML external entity injection, which was one of the OWASP top 10, and I think it's been removed or combined with another one, but it's still considered a serious vulnerability. And this is a property of XML. XML is the generalized markup language of which HTML is a subset, and a lot of modern uh, web transmissions are done in the format of XML, in particular AJAX, Applied Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, like Google Maps. These are things that let you make a request for just a little bit of data, not the whole page, which turns out to be extremely handy. So if the client is searching for something, for example, they might send a post to this ASHX script on the server, and then they'll send 44 bytes of data, and here it is in XML format, a search container, a search term container, and the close of that. So this is just sending up a search. So that's fine. And then the server will respond 200 OK, and it will send you the search result like no results found. So that's a simple example of an XML request and response. Now, XML supports this thing called entity references. What you can do is you can declare a document type, and then you can declare an entity. And this is like a alias uh, in the Unix command line. You declare this thing called test ref, and then that stands for whatever's in this value. So you can declare shortcut terms that will mean whatever object you put in here. In this case, it's not doing much of anything. but you, So here's an example. Um, you can send, uh, here's a simple XML output again, another example from Acunetrix. So I'm posting foo hello world foo, and the response just echoes back whatever was in the foo container. But what I can do is I can inject a doc type. If I define a doc type called foo, which, and, and a development, uh, an entity called bar that stands for world. Now I can do hello bar, and it will print hello world. I've defined a, a shortcut called bar that stands for world, and I can now use it. This is again harmless, but what you can do is I can define bar to be world, and t1 to be bar bar, and t2 to be t1, 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 and t3 to be t2, 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 t2 so it is multiplying every time I do this. So if I put in a T3, a T3 is a whole bunch of worlds. So as you can see, you can make a sort of zip bomb attack here that will create a very large output from a smaller input. And so uh, that's one way to do it. Another thing you can do is you can declare system references to files here. And now the XXE, when included in a page, will return the contents of that file. So you've got local file inclusion. And you can also call um, remote files with this. So now I'm going to get the contents of a remote file in the response. So that's remote file inclusion, again, through XML external entity. So that's the game. Um, that's what we had here, local file. And you can also do remote file. All right. You can also tell it to connect on the local network to a different port. So here it's going to try to reach a local server on port 25. And if it's an email server, then it, you may see something you can recognize and you can exploit vulnerabilities on them. Here you can go, here you can make a denial of service attack. This will load a file that goes on forever. So you'll get a long stream of random bytes, which will tie up the server. Um, all right. And another form of XML is SOAP. SOAP uses XML, Simple Object Access Protocol, and it's used a lot on the web. So you'll send a request like this. This is a POST request with 65 bytes of data, and it just has a bunch of parameters, from account, amount, to account, and submit. You send that up, but on the server, it is passed to another server. It goes to the web server and then moves over to a database server or something like that, and it uses XML. So it creates this XML request containing the data that you sent in. So the user controls these parameters inside the XML containers. And so what you do is you inject XML tags in your data. So the amount now includes all this data. And the account includes a closing comment tag, and this had an opening comment tag. 
So the resulting SOAP message here now has an amount of 1430 and it has a parameter called cleared funds, which is true. And then to account, and then it comments out the actual server's clear funds, which is false. And the account number is different too. So now, you know, now I've been able to, uh, well, it looks like it's the same account number, but in principle, it could be different. Anyway, the point is I'm now able to change from an unapproved transaction to an approved transaction by injecting an XML tag. Since it let me inject this less than and greater than and these comment characters, I was able to restructure the request. And here's another one. You can just end it in an opening comment tag, just like we did with SQL injection, and that will comment out the rest of the line. Um, it shouldn't be accepted without the closed comment tag, but it might. And if it is, then that would be an easy way to clean out what's missing. So if you want to find this, um, the simplest thing is just inject an unmatched closing tag. That should create an error. If it, there are no error occurs, then it's being filtered out. If an error occurs, then try putting in open and close and see if it vanishes. This would show that what you're sending is in fact being parsed. And so uh, you might find that it's being stored and used later, like a stored SQL injection. So then you'd submit one uh, line of data with this and another line of data with that. And your reply might include, uh, this might one be, be before that one. Um, I don't quite understand why it's the closing tag first and then the opening tag first, but that's the general idea. Include a couple of these and you might get uh, other tags to leak out, things like that. Um, if you're injecting a comment opening into one parameter and a closing into another parameter, that should just remove some chunk of the request and that might reveal something or break the logic in interesting ways. So to prevent it, you got to filter out all these characters or HTML encode them at every stage. So you can't put in less than, greater than, or slash. Uh, that would be good, although it is the uh, weaker defense I've talked about of deny listing, where you're trying to enumerate all the evil and remove it, which is intrinsically somewhat weak. All right, here's a few more kinds of injection. You can do HTTP redirection or parameter injection. Here's redirection. So um, we saw this a while ago, I think in the Amazon hack, hack, uh, Hackazon site. So here um, I'm posting something and it's gonna go to a location here to load some kind of CSS and the parameter is under my control. So I control that parameter and therefore what I can do is I can change the location to point to an IP address at a port number. Now I'm connecting to port 22. And so now when it tries to include that CSS file, it includes whatever comes back from here, which is an SSH header. And then an error protocol mismatch. So now I've been able to do a port scan inside their company network from their web server. And that's how you get around a firewall. That's using your app as a proxy. You can attack third parties on the internal network or on the internet, or connect back to other services on the app server itself. That sort of thing. Here's parameter injection. So here, um, this send from account to amount to account and submit are in the request, and those are used on the server. Um, all right. I don't remember what the point of that second one is. Anyway, so the front end server can bypass a check by adding cleared fund equals true. What I can do is just add that here, cleared funds equals true inside my list of parameters. And I haven't done that complicated XML injection to comment out the other cleared funds parameters. So on the server, it's now gonna have cleared funds equals true from me and the actual request that runs on the server will now have cleared funds equals true, and later on it will have cleared funds equals false. Now, it would be nice if, it, if the servers would just reject something that defines the same parameter twice, but it doesn't always do that. And the specifications don't consider this case. So some of them will just use the first parameter, ignore the second, or the second and ignore the first, or combine them, or turn it into an array. Different things might happen. So you might be able to override an important parameter by putting in an extra assignment of that parameter. 
So here's the original back end request, and here's the front end request with the added parameter. I have cleared funds equals true, and uh, so the back end request now has cleared funds equals true, and somewhere it will also have, I think, cleared funds equals false, but it may ignore it. All right. So another thing is URL rewriting. This is a property, especially on Apache. Um, there are these things called REST style parameters that you see a lot, where you put things in a URL that look like folders, but they're actually parameters. And the way this is actually done is with rewriting. You have these rewrite conditions that use these regular expressions. So it'll take this pub user Marcus and turn it into mode equals view, name equals Marcus. So we'll take the Marcus out of here and put it in ampersand name equals. I don't know why people do this, but this is the RESTful type um, structure. And this rewriting by means of a regular expression is kind of obviously exploitable. You just have to fool this regular expression. So for example, this one, Marcus and mode equals edit, will now turn into this, name equals Marcus and mode equals edit. I was able to put a parameter in here in what looked like a folder name, but it ends up being in a parameter. Ends up in a list of parameters after the rewriting. All right, and you can inject into SMTP servers. Uh, this is because SMTP takes plain text as the data. So if you have some kind of uh, form where people can send an email from your website, like a comment or complaint form, so here's a feedback form, your email address, subject, and comment. So if you fill it out with normal data, it will create, uh, it will send this message to the administrator, and you did not control this address. See, there wasn't a line for the to address. It automatically sends to the administrator, but you control the rest of this. And now I could put my email address and then a line feed and then BCC, because you can have the lines out of order. So to, from, BCC, subject. Now I'm able to add a BCC line because uh, HSMTP is just plain text, like HTTP. If I can inject a carriage return, I can inject whole lines here. So now I've added a copy of this email going to some other server. And now I can inject a whole thing down here. So this feedback request will here, site feedback message foo, that creates this one, which is correct but I can now inject, I can put in the subject field a from, and here's the subject, site feedback, carriage return line feed foo, carriage return line feed, mail from Viagra. Now I'm gonna send a whole X second email from their server to some other website advertising Viagra. And it's here's what's gonna happen because an email server just takes lines of checks and executes them. So here's the original email then I put a period which ends that email. Then I add a whole other email where I control everything, the from and the to and the data. Now I'm sending Viagra spam from their email server. So this is there's a similar request called HTTP response splitting, where you inject code which echoes back from the server and creates a whole fake web page. All right, so you inject into parameters, try these attacks, use both Windows and Linux new lines depending on which you might be hitting either kind of server. And if you want to prevent these things, of course, it's the same old thing. Validate user supplied data. Uh, make sure your email addresses really look like email and don't have new lines. Make sure your subject doesn't have any new lines. Make sure your content doesn't have lines containing a single dot, which would terminate the email and let another one come in after it. So same kind of thing. All right, let's look at another Kahoot. 10b here. I was teaching class a few semesters ago and one of the students found an open SMTP server on City College and I used it to send email in class. That was fun.
I'll give it a few more seconds. A uh, good thing, okay. All right, you set the same value twice. So what have you got? Alright, that's called parameter pollution. You got extra parameters that uh, don't belong there. Alright, which one uses a doc type? XML external entity. That's what that is. Which one uses HTML comments? Soap injection. And how about a line containing a single dot? SMTP injection. All right. ECC is one twice. And whoop. And HEMA. Okay. All right. 